Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma with a nonprofit organization that created our podcast, Rewriting Hollywood, which focuses on diversity, equity, inclusion, representation, as well as social impact in Hollywood, really looking at the power of storytelling, how it can be harnessed for social change and social good. Uh, we've been really fortunate to have some incredible guests, uh, including Oscar nominees, and, and today is no exception, uh, with director Joshua Seftel as a really powerful uh, documentary short now nominated for the Academy Award for Best Documentary Short here in 2023. Uh, it's called Stranger at the Gate, and it tells the story of a Marine who plans a terrorist attack in a mosque in a small American town. Uh, but his plan essentially takes an unexpected turn when he comes face to face with the people he's trying to kill, um, including the, the Muslim community in that town, which forces him to confront his own actions. Um, it's a it's a really uh, moving film, has a lot to say about our shared humanity and uh, shared trauma and much more. Um, so I'm really honored to have Joshua with us today. Uh, Joshua, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be here. That was a very um, succinct description of the film. That was good. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been practicing a couple of times. Um, so I, I just love the film. I mean, it's it's there's so much to talk about. So uh, I want to cram as much as we can in here with Joshua as we can. But I guess to start off, if you could... Uh, share a little bit of your your journey as a filmmaker, which, um, as I mentioned to you, we, we, we tend to like to ask for folks listening who might um, want to know how you kind of ended up where, where you are. I, I, you've, you've directed quite a few a variety of projects, but have also, I've seen, focused um, you know heavily in the documentary space. So was that always kind of where you felt you wanted to go as a filmmaker, or did you, did you veer and switch past a few times? Well, so I, I actually was planning to become a doctor. And um, I went to, I was pre-med in college and my dad was a doctor. I was going to follow in his footsteps. And, you know, I, my plan was I was, you know, going to become a doctor, join Doctors Without Borders, travel the world, help heal the world, you know. And after college, I took a year off before I applied to medical school. And I decided to um, to make a film. And it was a documentary about, Romania's abandoned children. And at that time, this was 1990, there were over 100,000 abandoned children in Romania and communism had just fallen. And so I went there and was like lived in the orphanages and had, I had a borrowed video camera. I was just filming the conditions and it was, you know, hor horrific. Um, mm. And the, the documentary I put together was on public television. And it, you know, I was 22, the film got nominated for an Emmy. And, but more importantly, the film led to the American adoption of thousands of Romanian children. Mm. And that was sort of this epiphany for me where I thought, wow, this like filmmaking is, can, can be very powerful. <laughs> and maybe I could do more good with this than if I became a doctor. And so that was sort of the turning point. And then I started making more documentaries and eventually branched out into things like, you know, I directed the, the first season of Queer Eye. Um, I felt that that was a really important show that was uh, had the potential to create change. Um, and then d did films like War Incorporated uh, with John Cusack and um, and... Uh, yeah, but it's always been the organizing principle of the work I've been doing has been kind of based around that idea that I was going to originally join Doctors Without Borders and try to heal the world. And, you know, not every one of my films does that, but I try to find a way to do some good if I can with the with the work or at least try to aim for that. So that's, yeah, that's my goal. Yeah, you, you really have um, established quite a body of work in that vein for sure um with the with your first foray as you said at age 22 with with your documentary lost and found um was like i'm curious like what what do you feel like drew you there i mean was it was it that notion of healing the world um was it some naivete as a you know 22 year old like i can i can go and maybe have an impact just just by being there, like, because I relate to that a lot. I did. I was drawn in college to do service projects around the globe, and maybe felt like, 
you know, hey, if I show up, maybe I can, maybe I can do some really, some really good things. What, what was that? What was that process like for you? Definitely naivete for sure. Yeah. I thought, yeah. Like, oh, I could probably figure this out, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I knew nothing. I, I hadn't, I didn't go to film school. I didn't um, know much about making films. I had made one little film in college, but, um, but you know, it was. I just figured it out, and I asked a lot of questions, and I had you know, pe good people helping me. I had some mentors and I really leaned into them for help. And, you know, I did the best I could. And I also had, you know, found a topic that was really just powerful. And with documentary, that's the most important thing often is like, do you have a great story? Uh, and, and I did. And so um, that it, it just worked in that way. And I sort of learned how to shoot I learned how to edit kind of on the fly <laughs> and right. uh, it sort of worked out it was good enough um that it, it it could tell the story in a powerful way and you know I learned a lot since then but that was um that was kind of like my film school yeah it's fascinating you kind of learn trial by fire um I'm curious I was going to ask you about mentors Josh in terms of like what those mentors said to you or did for you to help you along the way um it's something we believe in a, a lot um in terms of the power of mentorship and curious if you could share that and, and if you wanted to pass anything forward um to folks listening who might be looking for a little bit of guidance of what how they can find their way as a filmmaker well you know so one of the things I I like people always, you know, in your life are going to say like, oh, you should meet so-and-so or, or like your mom might say, you know, I know our cousin is blah, 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 or whatever, you know, and you might think like, oh, I don't want to meet them, you know, like, especially right. when you're young, you know, I would say always take the meeting, you know, no matter what, because you never know. And that's, that's what I did is like, at the college I went to, one of my professors said, hey, you know, there was a guy who graduated from here who makes films and um, you should meet him. And I was like, oh, OK. You know, and I went to his house and had lunch and like he was very generous. And, you know, a year later I was working for him and hmm. it was just, you know, it was just a, a huge opportunity for me. He was a, a, a working documentary filmmaker in Boston and. I, that was my first real job. Uh, and it's because I listened to my professor and went and met with him for lunch that that turned out. So I, I just think like grab the opportunities, grab the chances to meet new people when you're starting out because you never know who might become your mentor. You know, um, if you if you connect with them and you, you know, have that kind of chemistry that, that could happen. Um, and, you know, you should also prepare for those meetings, mm. you know, like do your homework, you know, I mean, there are so many times I, I can't even tell you how many times I've had interns meet with me and they're like, they walk into my office and they're like, so what's your deal? Like, how did you get into the industry? And I'm just like, do you know, like what Wikipedia is or IMDb? Yeah. Like, you know, at least come in with a better question than that, you know, like, um, and you know the people that come in and they're they're prepared and they have good questions that are thoughtful and that are actually like useful to them and not just wasting my time or their time i don't mean to sound like a jerk but i just think you, you yeah, need to be prepared um when you meet with people and know do your homework on them uh, in any in any industry but in this one too you know you, you need to go in and know what they did and know what what what's interesting about them to you and think about good questions that you want to ask them that would be helpful to you but that also show them respect and show them that you know who they are and what they've done and why you're taking their time to meet with them so i you know i would just recommend the preparation is very important in and in, in anything you do but as, even with meeting with new people yeah, no, I, I agree. I think I think it cuts both ways, right? I mean, you have to be, um, and it shows if you're prepared or if you're not prepared as a, as someone who wants to get into this very challenging and um, very very rocky industry, which which can can definitely um, be difficult for, as you said later on, if you're not prepared for the projects you're working on. You, yeah, you I mean, also took on 
Yeah, and you've also gotten Josh with like a, a bunch of other, you know, I would say um, related themes, but some interesting topics with the projects like taking on the Kennedys, political campaign film. You've, you've done an underdog sports film, the home team. Um, as you started to move through these different projects in your career, like were there, were you still thinking about a similar, I guess, um, calling as you were earlier, as you, you talked about a minute ago, of being drawn to kind of healing the world or, or maybe doing some good like what were there patterns of emerging and for you in terms of okay these are the types of stories I like to tell or, or or no yeah definitely I think I mean I would say like one of the themes for sure is the underdog um I've told a lot of underdog stories and <clears throat> that's that's always just been interesting to me I think it just makes for a good story but usually a lot of times underdog stories are often like about a way to see the world in in a in a positive way, you know, um, you know, underdogs or underdog stories is usually someone who's trying to achieve something important and um, people doubt them or whatever. They they have a lot of obstacles they're facing. So um, yeah, I, I would say underdogs for sure are a big thing, and just just social justice and trying to find the the goodness in people, you know, is definitely. You know, like that that sports film you mentioned, which was called The Home Team. It premiered at South by. Um, that was, um, you know, it's a story about a college basketball team, but it's really a story about race and about this mm. white town that embraced that embraced the black players that came to play on on their college basketball team. Uh, it's Murray, Kentucky and um, the yeah. Murray Racers. And, you know, it's just this kind of beautiful story about harmony in, in a, this small town. And uh, I was really drawn to that because I think stories like that are really inspiring and, and show, um, show people a way that the world can be. Right, as opposed to how it tends to feel or as, as it maybe it is in some ways. Um, also the project like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, um, obviously, like you alluded to a minute ago, I'm a deeply impactful project. And I can certainly say as a queer, queer Jewish guy, um, you know, that, that that's a, I think one of the, pro, one of the recurring projects now that has come back, but that is deeply given people a lot of voice um, and a lot of, I think, representation in ways we haven't seen before as well. Yeah. I mean, some people, I don't know if this is true, but it's hard to gauge, but some people think that it had a, a significant impact on, um, gay marriage yeah. just in passing was that show and obviously Will and Grace uh, were were television shows that just changed the move the needle and changed the way people thought about um, about you know that issue and uh, I was really proud to be a part of that show it's I, I think it's it was very exciting to be a part of it and it, it became you know, became the zeitgeist for a minute when, when we were making that show. This was the original Queer Eye. Right, the original. 2004. And, you know, it was like, I don't know, it was like we were on the cover of Entertainment Weekly and and just like we were everywhere. And, you know, the South Park did a spoof of it. You know, it was like we were in the cultural center for, yeah. I don't know, a few months at least. And it was very exciting to be a part of that because you knew, even though, you know, like South Park was spoofing or whatever, people saw it as important and um, something that we needed to talk about. So it was a great, that was a great moment in um, TV history, I guess, for me at least. Yeah, kudos to you for taking that on at a time when, um, and to the whole team behind that, at a time when, you know, it wasn't necessarily the most popular um, thing to, to, to take on. I, I also want to talk to you about, before we get to Stranger of the Gate, um, Secret Life of Muslims, because um, this was a Peabody Award finalist, Emmy nominee, a, a kind of an ongoing documentary series that you created uh, about, well, I'll let you talk about it, but it, but it seemed like it definitely led into this project, Stranger to the Gate, in certain ways. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about what drew you to that, to create that series and the impact that it, that it has had before we get to your latest project. For sure, yeah. So that was, you know, so I grew up in upstate New York and I was one of the, you know, not that many Jewish kids in, in my town. 
and and you know i got picked on um for being jewish like kids call me jew kike right. kids, kids threw pennies at me in the hall just to you know jews are cheap you know like pick up the pennies um uh someone threw a rock through our front window of our house you know things like that that stayed with me and you know then i became a filmmaker and after 9 11 when i saw my muslim friends facing hate you know and similar kind of hate i felt a connection to them and i was like you know maybe there's something i can do to help in a little some small way and so, so i started making these short docs like really short like two minutes long three minutes long um that were presenting american muslim profiles of and stories and just showing sharing stories that weren't being told you know like there was nothing like that being told it was just all everything on the news was about like terrorists and fear and and so i made these films and and they started getting shared a lot on social media you know on facebook and it was like you know some of them were getting millions of views and people were you know it was like it was a it was a narrative that people needed and wanted and like, i remember one of the comments because you could see on facebook like the the comments we were getting and <clears throat> you know there was a lot of hate but there were also people like this woman wrote she like tagged her mom and she said mom this film you got to watch this like this is what i've been trying to explain to you mm. you know and it was like okay this is amazing you know like we are getting through to people and we're giving them like these tools like, these little tiny films to share with people they love to show them a different way to think you know to show them through a through a compelling story to show them um a different way you know and and i think that series has, to date has like 70 million views hmm. and still being shared around and they're, they're all for, they're all free on youtube and <clears throat> facebook and you know they're they're out there and we've made 25 shorts the and this film stranger at the gate that is in my current film which is um vying for a oscar right now is um yeah. is part of that series yeah it is and it's it's a it's a just moving film in its own right um but you know, I was I was gonna ask you as, as you made this this series, Secret of Muslims, like what what the response has been from the Muslim community, and um, curious, like, did you have trepidation going into this project in terms of you know as a as a guy not from the community, like how you were gonna how you gonna do these portrayals? Yeah, for sure. And so what <clears throat> what we did is we we built an, a board of advisors. Uh, I think it's like about 20 people and you know we really relied on them to guide us and a lot of them they're not all Muslim people from the Muslim community but a lot of them are and um, and we had some of our team members were Muslim and so we we really tried to create a, a team and a you know a board of advisors that was very diverse and could provide lots of different perspectives and um and that was very helpful you know that was really important but it was it was definitely like a little scary to wade into that water without you know not being muslim but at the same time i grew up you know with a lot of discrimination so i felt like i kind of understood like what it what it feels like and i also I think I know how to tell stories pretty well. And so I, um, you know, I, I think that storytelling is so powerful for things like this, you know, for trying to um, change the way people think or present them with new models, new, new, kind, new kinds of characters that they haven't encountered before, but exist in the world. And, and so that was the exciting part was like, how do we like blow people's minds? How do we like show them things they've never seen before but should have seen how do we get them you know the equivalent of like meeting someone new who changes the way you think about the world right. that's what we wanted these films to do was to like here's someone new you can meet through this film 
and uh, it's going to probably change the way you you think going forward. And so uh, that was that was how we thought about it. Yeah, I, I would say you've absolutely achieved that. It's, it's certainly with the latest product, Stranger at the Gate. So, which I want to talk to you about. So this story is, you know, as you've described it, it's kind of a collision course between this Marine, you know, this veteran, um, Richard Mac McKinney, and, and the congregants of the Muncie Islamic Center. Talk about, if you would, like how you first heard about this story, and um, or at least the beginnings of the story, and what was the process like of kind of going into this community and and starting to to undergo those interviews? Because I understand you you had some footage with Mac, and then you kind of expanded to the to work with the congregant. That's right. Yeah. So we first we first heard about this story through a newspaper article. You know, it was um, in USA Today University Edition, which is like a very obscure uh, paper. But we someone on my team, uh, I think it was Anna Rowe, found it found the article and then we we went and we tried to find Mac the the US marine who um was planning to bomb this mosque and <clears throat> we we were able to track him down and we invited him to New York and we interviewed him and we made a short a little short film 4 minute long thing and it was it it had a huge reaction i mean i think it had 10 million views on um wow. between youtube facebook and elsewhere and we were like okay this is there's more to this story and there's more we could do here because we didn't talk about the congregants of the mosque because the the rest of the story is that he wanted to bomb the mosque he goes to the mosque to scope it out and to like figure out how he's going to pull this off and he, the people he meets when he gets there the congregants are like these you know afghan refugees bibi barami and sabra barami who founded the the mosque and they welcomed him with like with incredible kindness you know like like Saber got down on his knees and hugged Mac's legs when he right. walked in you know and Mac was like a scary dude like he you know he's got tattoos all over his arms and he's a big you know muscly guy with like a skull tattoo on his hand and you know he and but they just they just welcomed him in and they were they showed him compassion because they could tell that he had problems, you know, yeah. it was apparent to them. And, you know, uh, from there, it just, uh, it just turned into this beautiful transformation. But, um, but the way that we, the way that we um, told the story was we had to find BB and Saber and, you know, I couldn't find them for the longest time. We had their number, but they would never call back. And finally, um, they I reached them, and I found out that Bibi, the the wife and co-founder of the mosque, had actually had this grave medical problem, and she had been in a coma for um, and was near death. Wow. But she, when she heard about the story, and you know, initially she was like, "Oh, this Jewish guy is calling me from New York. Like, what? Well, you know, what's going on here?" But then. I told her my background and she was like, you know, I was near death and this seems like an opportunity for me to, to tell part of my story and my mission. Um, so even if I do end up dying soon, I'll, this will be preserved. And so it really like, it sort of worked very well for what her goals were. And, um, and we came to Muncie, Indiana soon after that and started filming the community and you know spending time in the mosque and figuring out a way to tell this story in a in a you know in a in an exciting way so that was like la not this past summer but the summer before is when we we filmed and then we edited through the winter and premiered at big sky about a year ago mm -hmm. that was about a year ago I think Big Sky is like about to happen right now. So about a year ago, yeah, yeah, the film festival. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just an incredible story. Obviously, and I encourage folks to watch the film uh, in full. But what struck you as you started to work with the congregants? I mean, uh, imagine their kindness, as you said, which is um, as they describe it in the film, 
and as you just described it, pretty extraordinary. Um, not even something I would say we see, you know, every day outside of uh, this congregation, and at least definitely not in the media. Um, yeah. uh, so, like, I'm curious, just sort of what struck you, or what you felt like was motivating this kindness um, that maybe we can all learn from. Um, because as, yeah, as they described it, the congregants described it, they, they immediately noticed Mac was, was troubled and were, I mean, I think a few of them said they felt like he was dangerous, um, but were drawn to embrace him. Yes. I mean, so th there's this idea of welcome the stranger, you know, the idea of welcoming the stranger and they really subscribe to that. And, and, uh, I think that is, is part of, you know, it's a, a value in Islam, uh, and they, so, you know, they treated us, the film crew, in the same way that they treated Mac. I mean, they welcomed us in. They cooked for us. They, you know, Bibi had us in her home and cooked for our whole crew. You know, she, it was there's just so much generosity and kindness. And um, that value is something they bring to anyone they meet. And it's really beautiful. It's I think it's inspiring because... It's something we need right now, I think, in our culture. You know, we're we're at a time of great division. We're not talking to each other. We don't talk to people who are different from us anymore. You know, oh, someone voted for someone we didn't vote for. Right. Like we not even be friends with them anymore. You know, it's like, I don't know when this happened. It seems like it happened in the last 10 or 15 years, but it's not good. I don't think it's a good thing for us to not be uh communicating with people who are different from us and we're we're too isolated and living in bubbles with with just people that agree with us and i think this film to me is kind of an uh inspiring story about how to think in a different way and how to try to build bridges i mean the fact that bb barami who you know was once the target of Richard McKinney, he wanted to kill her. Mm -hmm. Bibi Barami and Richard McKinney can be friends today, and they are friends. Is if they can do that, then any of us can can do this. You know, we can find a way to build bridges with people because we have to start doing it. And that that's that's what to me is very important about this film. Is it's what inspired me about the story. Is that. Um, it's just a, a beautiful thing to find our shared humanity with other people. And, you know, like, it, it's funny because in a, in a very small way, like in one way, I've been affected by BB. You know, we, we joke around that we, we should make t-shirts that say, what would BB do? And with mm -hmm. her face on it, you know, um, but w like when I fly on planes, like I, I don't love flying because you're, you know, usually crowded in and you're sitting next to stranger and there's sometimes they're in your space and my reaction was uh, would always be like oh my god I, I hate i hate that person you know like they're <laughs> yeah, yeah. making part of my leg room or their mm -hmm. like arm is on my armrest or and then i i was like what would bb do you know and i just now i just like turn to them and i'm like hey how are you doing today you know or mm -hmm. where are you where are you headed or whatever and mm -hmm. i start making conversation and almost always that feel that feeling of frustration and animosity toward them just like almost instantly just melts away you know and yeah. and and i feel i feel happier you know um and it's uh it's a powerful thing and it's a simple thing it's something we all of us can do and uh if we all were a little more like bb i really believe the world would be better we'd have fewer problems yeah, I mean, she's really extraordinary. I mean, just hearing, I think it was her family was talking about her her own journey and I think being a refugee and and just uh, all that she's gone through. Uh, it's striking that people like her and her specifically that have gone have seemingly suffered so much. Um, and and as she talked about, I think also the impact of nine eleven and feeling targeted, you know, and getting these kind of very. Um, stereotypical kind of hateful questions you know that she would get as she was just moving about the world um and her community yet she is she is like the most the epitome of kindness um and so i wonder like what you think 
um, what do you think is keeping us from um, doing that more often? Like, do, do you feel like the, you know, the media landscape is impacting us? Do you feel like um, the stories we see are impacting us, our, our separation? Like, are, are there a lot of factors or do you feel like there are, cer- there are certain things that are keeping us divided in so many ways and kind of yelling at each other at the State of the Union type of thing? What, what, what's, what's, what do you think is going I on? mean, that's a really hard <laughs> question. It's a hard question. It's something I think about a lot. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the answer, but I do think that, you know, while social media obviously connects us in, in many ways, it also isolates us or, or keeps us in tighter groups that are, you know, more, you know, tend to be like all the people like us. Right. You know? So we don't get to meet people who are different from us as often. And I I also just think it's harder to it takes a little bit more energy to be friendly to someone when you're out in the world than to just ignore them or even feel like a little bit of irritation toward them. Right. <laughs> you know, it takes a little more energy to, to be like, oh, how can I find some common ground with this person? How could I find a connection with this person? How could I find our shared humanity? You know, that's harder to do. It's a little harder to do, but I think it's much more pleasurable than than the other, you know, at the end of the day. And um, and uh, it's, you know, it's not something I do all the time, but I've been trying to more and more. And I think it makes life richer for people who do that. And I, you know, I look at someone like Bibi, who is really the hero of this film. And she, you know, when she meets someone who, she finds out hates Muslims. The first thing she does is she invites them over for dinner. Mm. And she says, you know, she says, I feel sorry for them that they have to live with that hate in their heart. And I, you know, I want to help them. And she invites them over for dinner. And I mean, she's kind of like a saint, you know, Um, know, she invites them over for dinner and she tries to, you know, she feeds them and she tries to show them a different way of thinking um, by sharing herself with them, you know, and, and her kindness and her stories. And, uh, and I think it's, it's quite effective. You know, I think she's changed a lot of people's minds and it's, it's powerful. Hmm. Yeah, it is. I think our family described it as like a Mother Teresa of community. I mean, just inviting people over for dinner all the time or, or to stay over if they need a place to stay, um, which is really, really inspiring. Um, I was going to ask you before I let you go about shared trauma, because um, I, I know you talked about this. You've talked about this in connection to the film as well, um, that we a lot of us do share a trauma. Um, certainly in the film, Mac shares a trauma with you know, he, as he talks about having been trained to essentially kill and in the military, kill Muslims and um, having done that. And then obviously maybe having shared trauma from her own journey. Um, Could you just talk about that as a source of maybe connection and a place for healing? Because I thought that was, that was a really moving almost mirror in the film that we saw too. Yeah, I I think, you know, it was, uh, as we were, working on the film initially we were like wow all these people have some kind of trauma and that is what that was the in some ways one of the shared part of the shared humanity that they had you know like all of our main characters like Bibi and Saber they were Afghan refugees they lived in a refugee camp they were involved in the you know the war in Afghanistan they escaped um Jomo Williams African-American convert who also welcomes Mac to the mosque. He was, you know, he has a long uh, history in his family of, you know, of violence toward toward them because they're African-American. So like his great grandfather was um, castrated and and lynched, you know? And and so he, he has that trauma. And as a result, he initially, he hated white people, as he said. you know, and then you have Mac, who went abroad and was fighting wars and being asked to kill Muslim people. And 
you know, he comes back with this trauma. And so they all connected around that. And that was in some ways the power of the story is that they they did have this shared humanity and it was it was around trauma. Um, but that was, but they were able to relate to each other because of that. And that was the power of of having that shared experience. Um, and ultimately that that shared humanity that that saved lives, you know, in the end. Initially it caused Mac to think in the wrong way, uh, in, in, in that he wanted to commit mass murder, you know. Right. But ultimately it um it was the thing that allowed him to and allowed the, the others, the the members of the Moss to connect with each other and to build a, a, a friendship that lasts even today. You know, um, Mac just got remarried and mm. uh, BB and Saber, uh, B, or Saber moderated, or what's the word, um, officiated the wedding yeah. and um, BB cooked all the food, you know, wow. for his wedding. So, you know, th this guy who was once planning to murder them is now his wedding is being hosted by the people who were his intended victims. You know, that's, it's just incredible to me. It is incredible. And that, and it goes in this extraordinary way to the shared connections that we all have um, and the interconnectedness of things. Um, I was, I guess my last question for you, Josh was just around what your hope is after, you know, making this film, obviously it's getting a lot of deserved attention um, I guess hope in terms of the kind of society you'd like us to build or you hope we build in the in the in the image of, of maybe the story. Um and or I guess another way to answer that question, maybe the type of stories you think we should be we could use more of. Um I wonder what your thoughts are on, on any parts of that. Well, I think the the Muncie, the Muncie, Indiana, where this film takes place, that town and what happens in this film is some ways like in some ways is like what I imagine America could be you know it's this mm -hmm. place where you have like a black person uh, a couple of immigrants and a white guy who's a veteran all becoming friends with each other you know <laughs> um, granted there's a huge obstacle they have to overcome for that to happen but it's you know, that's, I think that's the future of our country or could be. And in some ways, this, what happens in this story is to me is like a, a bit of a blueprint for how to do that. You know, um, mm. that's what I hope for, you know, I, that's what I hope for. Uh, you know, when we showed this film to the mosque, um, you know, in Muncie, where we filmed it, mm. we finished the film and the, we wanted to share it with them to make sure they they liked it before we really shared it with the world and so we had a screening in the basement of the um islamic center about 80 people came and when the lights came on after you know i wasn't sure what people would think if they would like it or wouldn't like it and some someone stood up in the back of the room and he said um he said you know this film we need to make sure every american sees it Mm. and you know i've just those words are are at the top of mind for me you know i feel a a responsibility to make that happen as best we can and that's kind of the that's the mission we're on right now yeah beautifully said and i i certainly hope every american sees it um or will see it because you know i'm certainly already passing it around i think it, i think you have a knack for um making stories that, that we want to share and in, in, in the best of ways so um thank you for doing that thank you for making this project uh again it's stranger at the gate it's available right now uh on youtube you can, you can check it out right now um directed by joshua so tells dominate for an academy award for best documentary short um thank you again joshua for for being here but also for for making this film I'm excited to see what you do next as well thanks so much thanks jared okay.